Sometimes I get comments about my sermons. Yes, it does happen from time to time. And one of the comments that I've heard since we started preaching through the Bible story in September is that studying the Bible and worship is a good thing, but the sermon better touch lives where people are and deal with the issues that folks are facing. Well, if that's your way of thinking, then today is your day. Both of the readings for the day talk about temptation. And they have everything to do with who we are and who God created us to be. I guess that probably strikes a chord with just about everybody here this morning, or at least it should. As we look at who we are as Christians in a complicated world and comparing ourselves with other faiths and as we see what's going on in the rest of our world, the reading from Genesis seems appropriate as well, the story of the fall. Those who told the story of creation were trying to lay a foundation to explain why in the world we do some of the things that we do. What is wrong with us? If God created us good, then why is there so much bad in the world? If God created us good, why were a thousand people killed by terrorists in Nigeria in God's name this past week? If God created us good, why is there a group like ISIS who is beheading people who don't agree with them? Why do all these things happen? Why is there so much evil in the world? Now, let me know if I'm hitting on points that would qualify as issues that you deal with in life today. This is a story in Genesis about what it means for us to be human. And it's not a very happy picture. Here we have Adam and Eve living lives of peace and plenty in this garden that God created for them given to them to till and to tend and to enjoy. It's the perfect setup. All they have to do is live and enjoy. That's it. And yet, even in this paradise, they are incomplete and insufficient and feeling insecure about themselves. And the serpent in the story plays on this insecurity, and he calls into question whether or not God, their creator, can be trusted. He says, hasn't God told you everything? Completeness, wholeness, self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency, you can have it all. You can be masters of all that you survey. Didn't God tell you that? And he names the fact that they are incomplete as they are. And these new creations feel the ache from the very beginning to find a way to become whole. The serpent in the story is onto something. Maybe you've heard it said that we all have a void like that in our lives. And the serpent seizes the opportunity to name that as a flaw that needs to be fixed and fixed as quickly as possible. But the Genesis story does not see that as a flaw in our makeup, but rather as part of the plan of our Creator. That hole that we feel, that gap in our lives that the serpent pointed out to Adam and Eve is not shapeless or formless. There's a space in our lives that is perfectly shaped for God and for God alone to fill. There's something that we search for in life that's going to keep us connected to God, that will keep on calling us back to God, that keeps on telling us that something just is not quite right in our lives that these things in our world will keep on happening until God is plugged in to fill the gap. I read that instead of the Genesis story pointing out the idea of original sin, maybe the story instead paints a picture of original insecurity. Look at what happens. The serpent offers Adam and Eve this possibility that original insecurity can be overcome not through their relationship with God, which was already there, but through the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that fruit, in that moment, looks to be shaped just like the void they were feeling in their lives. They heard the word, God might not always be here for you, but 
But God wouldn't want you to feel lost without him. So here, take a bite. And we've been scrambling to find God's substitutes ever since. Just look at how we're bombarded each day through the media and advertisements or whatever with all the things that folks want to share with us that will make us better people, that will make us more acceptable, that will make us better this or better that. And the story of God's people all through the Old Testament is a record of the poor choices that were made for something to fill a void that only God could fill. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we flip through the pages of the story ahead to the reading of Matthew for this morning. A lot of ground has been covered since the Genesis story. God has continued creating and recreating. There's been a flood. There's been the promise of a nation. People have been enslaved and set free. There's been a wandering in the wilderness and the arrival of the promised land. Kingdoms have been raised up. Kingdoms have fallen and been defeated. And always the people have been driven by a feeling of insecurity that in spite of all the promises of God, God might not be completely trustworthy. There's that whisper of the tempter that comes up time and time again. What if God doesn't come through for you? What if God doesn't end up being there when you get there? Do you have a backup plan? What if? What if? And when you read the struggles of the people all through the Old Testament, it's pretty clear that that whisper did a pretty good job of fanning the flames of insecurity in their lives. And then along comes Jesus. And as you read the story, there seems to be every indication that this whole insecurity question is going to be answered once and for all. Right from the very beginning, when Joseph was given the word that his soon-to-be wife was already expecting a child, he heard the good news that they would not face the future alone, but that God would be there. And he and Mary had a lot to feel insecure about. But the answer was always the same. I will be there. Even the name of the child was given as a promise. They shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, no matter what happened, no matter how unclear the road ahead seemed, no matter how many questions seemed uncertain, Mary and Joseph would be secure in the knowledge that God was with them. Through the questionings and the ridicule and the judgments that swirled around them during the pregnancy, God was with them. Through a difficult journey to Bethlehem, God was with them. Through that amazing birth event, God was with them. As they fled to Egypt, God was with them. As they raised the child, God was with them. God filled that hole of insecurity. And then, as Jesus stepped out to mark the beginning of his ministry, he came to be, to be baptized. Now, we don't know what was going through his mind as the water from the Jordan River streamed down over his head. But if we believe that Jesus was not only the Son of God, but also that he was fully human, there must have been some questions and nagging insecurities about his future too. And then there were these words, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Could God have been any more clear about that relationship? Jesus knew who he was. He was God's beloved son and God was pleased with him. Now, less than four verses later, we read this. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, if, for Jesus there was no doubt, the words of his baptism would ring in his ears, You are my beloved Son. He knew who he was. And that was truth that gave him the strength to stand against temptation, and that is truth that gives us hope as well. Now it would be easy for us to look at this passage and compare Jesus' ability to resist temptation and 
try and copy what he did. And we would fail miserably. We might say, if I just knew the scripture as well as Jesus did, then, then maybe I could quote a passage from memory just when I need it. Then I could be strong against temptation just as he was. But we could never know the Bible that well. We could never do enough to be on the same level as Jesus. And so we would keep stumbling and battling and falling in the face of temptation. But there's one thing we can do. We can know where we stand in our relationship with God. Jesus knew who he was. Do you know who you are? Do you know that you are a loved child of God? In spite of your past, in spite of your failures, in spite of your broken promises, in spite of everything, do you know that you are loved by God more than you could ever imagine? I think we're still trying to fill that same God-shaped hole in our lives that pushed Adam and Eve to share the fruit in the garden. We are still living in fear of disappointing God by not doing enough, and we feel that if we just do a little bit more, we can fill that void and please God in some way. We're afraid that we just aren't living up to our potential. And we get caught in a trap of thinking that God really doesn't believe in us after all. Maybe you've seen this commercial. Wow. Did you know that Gale was a bad motivational speaker? I look around this room and I see nothing but untapped potential. You have potential. You have a oh boy. <laughs> How many of you felt, have felt the failure that you saw in that man's face in the crowd? Maybe you felt that as you came to worship this morning. Maybe you had a bad week. Maybe you failed to follow through on a promise you made to a friend. Maybe you didn't stand strong and did what you knew was the wrong thing or said what you realized was the wrong thing or you didn't say or you didn't do anything when something needed to be said or done. Perhaps you heard the voice in your head say, if you were a child of God, you could have done better. That's a big if. But the good news is that you can take that if right out of the conversation because you are children of God. There is no failure or misstep that is going to change that and so we begin worship with a prayer together that's honest about our failures in confession. Knowing who we are means knowing that we do stumble and fall. Knowing who we are means that we know that we fail. But knowing who we are, children of God, means that even our worst failures will not keep God from loving us. Let me say that again. Even our worst failures will not keep God from loving us. And that is what gives us the strength and the hope to continue walking in faith together. We'll never get it right. That's not our job. That's what makes us human. But God has made us right by grace. That was Jesus' job. And thanks be to God that Jesus did it well. Our job, our response, is to continue the journey. Our job is to continue to walk in faith even when we fail. Our job is to continue to love God with everything we've got, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our job is to love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. That's our job. Never doubt that God is with you, that Jesus is calling you. Keep on walking. And don't be afraid of anything because you are a child of God. Amen. Gracious God, may we stand on the hope that you give to us. Hope grounded in your gracious love for us that will never be taken.
can go. May we stand. May we be made strong in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. And hear his call in our life. Every moment of every day. Thank you for not giving up on us. Give us faith not to give up on you.